Um, well, today I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Omar Epps, who I believe needs no introduction. Um, I would like to start by saying uh, we're also joining him on the week of his birthday. So I think maybe we should sing him happy birthday. <laughs> that would be weird. Uh, happy birthday. We got to do the Stevie to Wonder you. version. <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> to. There we go. Happy birthday Day. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Before we get started, I just want to thank you all for uh, uh, blessing me with your time and being here um, to share this uh, monumental moment with me. And I'm just appreciative for uh, each of you being here. So thank you. So you all know Omar as an actor and producer, and today he's with us as a writer. Um, he is well known for his roles as Q and Ernest Dickerson's cult classic Juice, uh, opposite Tupac Shakur, as Quincy in the beloved romance Love and Basketball, <laughs> as Dr. Eric Foreman on House, <laughs> and as Darnell on This Is Us. You can't forget Raising Canaan, season three is coming soon. <laughs> um, he wrote a memoir called From Fatherless to Fatherhood, and Nubia, The Awakening is his first novel. So you don't know me, my name is Krista Marino. I am here with Omar today as his editor at Delacorte Press, which is an imprint of Random House children's books. Um, and we are going to discuss the novel Nubia, The Awakening. So let me set the stage. Couldn't have done it without you, Chris. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you so you much. Know. This woman is amazing, by the way. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. So let me set the stage. It's 2098. New York City is crumbling. It's climate ravaged. The newest refugees are from a fallen country called Nubia, off the coast of Africa. Nubia was a utopia, and after a catastrophic storm, the island was destroyed, and the Nubians found their way to Manhattan, which is now called Tri-State East, and settled in what was once the financial district, now called the Swamp. It's the most climate-affected section of the city. So this is where they now live, struggling to survive, in a city that, with an even broader socioeconomic gap, rampant corruption, and ecological dev devastation. This story centers on three teens, the first generation of American-born Nubians, as they develop powers that their parents thought their people had lost. Um, so first and foremost, Nubia, The Awakening. The Awakening part of the title teases a bit of the story, but I'd love to talk about the title Nubia. It's a real historic region in Africa, and in this book, it's the name of a lost island nation. Why did you name this nation Nubia? Uh, Nubia, to me, I mean, it has a lot of uh, historical significance, um, and there's a lot of power behind that um, for all people, but especially for uh, black and brown people. So it just kind of uh, rang to me to start there. Um, as I was, you know, conceiving the idea, I couldn't get it out of my head. So, you know, I just roll with it. <laughs> um. I mean, when you're talking about the conceiving the idea, this world that you created is enormous. And I think like, when I got um, the process of bookmaking is, you know, Omar sent out, his agent sent out the submission, which outlined pieces of the story, also had a big section of the story, and then um, the world. And the world building came with like maps and, and photos and like what the world would look like in 2098 in this world. And it was so deeply, uh, it was so deeply thought through that it was like the biggest piece of the puzzle for me. I was like, okay, they get the world. And that's something that many authors don't have worked out. They have worked out the surface, but not the deep, deep, deep history. Um, so I would love to know how you worked through the world building and, and the idea for the book and where that came from. And did it evolve over time or did it hit you like they say it's a, like a moment of, you know, it just came at once, or was it like something that you worked through for years and years? For me, um, 
the concept of, of, of this book uh, came from a simple idea. We live in such a turbulent world, and I was thinking to myself one day, what if love itself was illegal, like actually against the law, and then reborn through this 14-year-old kid? And he is love itself. That's where the nugget started for me. And so the world building came from that. Then I started thinking about, um, as you mentioned, you know, climate change. What's, what is it going to look like in 100 years when, when we're not around? Surprise, surprise. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, what, uh, you know, the socioeconomic things, because the underlying theme that I hope that you guys and all the readers get from this is about unity, right? Like, we're, we're kind of like, as human beings, in certain regards, we're like hamsters on a wheel, right? If you watch the news, you just see the same old thing over and over. But when you go out and actually meet people, we all have the same uh, things that we want, that we, we all have the same desires, you know? Mm -hmm. We want the best for our families, best for our kids, we want to take care of ourselves and, you know? And so it's, I kept it simplistic, well, at least in my brain, I, it, to me it was simplistic in that way, but building out like a world was a, that was the challenging part because it was like, you know, and you were a big part of that in terms of paying attention to every detail. And, um, and, I, and I think we did that. We had fun making a map um, that will be in the final book. And that was interesting because we had to talk about like, oh, what would happen when the sea levels rise in New York City? And like, where would they put the seawalls, which also are, is an important part of the story. Yeah, yeah, and just dealing with like things that we're dealing with now. Like what if, what, what if this climate change thing goes the other way, right? Like what does our world look like? And I'm a New Yorker, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn in the house, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like really trying to imagine, I mean, we already saw what uh, Hurricane Sandy did to lower Manhattan. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you guys have seen the, um, what's that film with uh, Michael, the, the second one? Uh, Edge of Tomorrow? Day After Tomorrow? No, the, the film about climate change. The one with Jake Gyllenhaal? No, the one with the, the documentary. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm blanking. I'm so excited to be here. My brain is... Michael Moore. Boom. Yeah. The second one, you know, they have charts of what could... In the first one, they had charts of what would possibly happen in like seven years after that. And then when we look at the graphs, when Hurricane Sandy hit, it was exactly how those charts looked. And in that second film, um, that documentary, they were charting what things could possibly look like in the future. So in this film, I wanted to explore, okay, the, the worst version of that, not in a negative way, but like, because people are still gonna be here and be alive, you know, what, how are they living? Like, what does what the city look like? What does the world look like, you know? Because the world is, oh, I don't want to use the word ravaged because that's such a negative kind. The world has just changed, right? It's evolved, right? Um, and who are these kids? And that's why it was important to me to, to have the, the, our main characters, Uzochi, Lencho, and Zuberi, be these teenagers who are trying to figure out life because that's like the, the it's like the fun part of life. Like you don't have too much responsibility because you ain't paying no bills. You know what I mean? But teenagers are awkward anyway. It's just a weird, you know, you're growing, your, your teeth are weird, you, you, you know what I mean? Like, and so like this bunch of kids who are just trying to figure out life, but in, you know, that sort of circumstance and then add on these sort of, um, I guess you could say, how would you say it? Like, Mystical layers? Yes, like magical. Uh, magical, magical layers because um, um, they come from a place like Nubia, at least in, in, in our book, you know, it was a utopia, you know? Um, this is the backstory. It was a utopian society. Everybody was in perfect balance with the land and their environment and each other, right? And then obviously, you know, by the book, I won't give it away, but. <laughs> Some things happen, and everyone finds themselves basically as 
refugees in a foreign land, you know? And I also wanted to explore that, the idea of, um, it, I guess you could say immigration. Yeah. You know, displacement, that would be a better word. You know, the idea of displacement and how people deal with one another under those circumstances and the consequences of that, um, you know, dealing with their families and so forth and so on. But again, I wanna reiterate that um, the important message that I want all you guys to get from this book is the, the, the idea of unity. Because, you know, we have more in common than not. No matter where you come from, no matter what culture you come from, your socioeconomic background, your country, your, none of that, it, we're all human beings, you know? And I really wanted to sort of unpack my version of what that could look like through this book. I wanna come back to the characters, the three point of view characters in the book, um, but you said something that was really interesting. Uh, really, this is an Afrofuturist fantasy, which you know it involves the uh, centering black characters in a future world where that has what the futurist, what is the techn? It's the genre crosses a lot of different areas, right? Yeah, so yeah. it can go in like a Black we, Panther way I didn't make with it tech. Easy. <laughs> yeah, it could go in like Octavia Butler where there is uh, time travel. There's so many different, you know, um, the, what can we call it? The new, not new, we're both like requiring help from the audience today. Um, the <laughs> Watchmen uh -huh. that, you know, so there's so many different fingers in so many different spaces of, of fiction. Um, and this is action packed. This is more fantastical with the supernatural powers. Um, but what you said about like New York City, I feel like New York City is kind of the fourth character. Yeah, <laughs> In it is. that um, it's classically been a city that has welcomed immigrants and there's always been different waves like you know the Irish the German the Korean like they've not in that order mm -hmm. um and they are <laughs> not in that specific order but they become the like lowest level of the socioeconomic cycle and then the next wave comes in and with this new added level of um climate displacement we and we're seeing this in Europe we're seeing like the war move the Ukrainians across Europe right. here everywhere um, putting the Nubians not only in the space of being um, black from Africa but also being the new immigration wave and kind of like really a commentary on the racism of our country, of New York City, and how they're dealing with that just as teenagers. So you really dug into like different ways of life that you see in this in that space. Like there's yeah. some kids that are in gang life. Yeah. There's some kids that are like dealing with drugs or some kids that are have single parents. I'd love to hear you like unpack the importance of that for you. Yeah, I wanted to um I wanted the reader to, because obviously you'll be reading it now, right? So I just wanted to create a story that uh, you can connect to, but also visualize at the same time. And so, you know, uh, we spoke on the displacement thing, but when it comes to the ism, is what I call it now, right? There's all types of isms, but you said racism, but it's just like it's, it's only because they're Nubians. And I wanted to separate, I know the historical significance of Nubia in Africa, but I wanted to separate Nubia in this book because it's like they're Nubians. They're actually not really Africans, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to even to have that, um, not sort of separation like one is against the other, but just like this was this perfect world, perfect place, right? And the socioeconomic uh, thing, in the book, I unpack this a lot. Um, there's a, um, so basically Midtown, Uptown Manhattan is now the up high. And the up high is where all the technology is, all the riches are, they live above everything and, and um, you know, they've got everything, right? And the Nubians basically live in the swamps and like you said, when you talk about um, gang life, it's, it's, it doesn't come across that way in the book Again, it's more about unity. It's like they got to stick together to, to be safe, 
to go to school, to come back from school. Like, you know, you can't take the bus by yourself. We, we got to walk together, and it's more that type of vibe. Um, and then even on the other side, um, with the other kids who are uh, basically, they're the New Yorkers that were there, they kind of have the same vibe. Like, hey, these kids are coming out of school now, and, you know, they taking our girls. They taking our lunch money and, you know, the, the stuff that kids go through, you know, I wanted to reflect that in the book, but, but in, a, in a more um, elevated way. That's the right word. Mm -hmm. You know, in a more elevated way and really, really unpack the, the emotions and the mentality of our three main characters. Which brings me back to the three main characters, yeah. which are the heart of the story. Yeah. Um, Zuberi, Uzochi, and Lencho. And for me, I was always all, give me more Zuberi, but <laughs> I, I know that Lencho and Uzochi are, uh, it's, there's a lot of conflicts, they're cousins. Um, how did you come up with these three kids? And Well, this, this, wow, they got some base out there. I know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the simple way to look at it, honestly, is Uzochi represents love. Lencho represents hate, but they're cousins because their fathers were brothers. And then Zuberi is the gray area of humanity in the middle. So she, do, she does what needs to be done when it needs to be done, but she's, a, she's good at heart. And I thought it would be fun to sort of put that in a washing machine and, you mm -hmm. know, and, and see how it comes out. Um, because I'm a firm believer of like, you know, we've all been raised a certain way. We all have our beliefs that we have the right to have, but no one truly knows what they'll do until they're faced with that circumstance, right? And so that's why, again, it was important to me that to tell this story through these teenagers' eyes, mm -hmm. because they're still in a developmental stage of life, that like they're still trying to figure out what's, what, you know, and also, I just wanna speak on this real quick. Yeah. The idea of like tribalism right like personally i feel like um that's a there's two things it's a natural way to be as a human being because we all come from a family and in some version of a tribe and i also feel like that's the root of a lot of our conflict right right against left democrat against republican white against black black against hispanic like you could just go man against woman, like you could just go on and on and on, but we're all human beings, mm -hmm. you know? And hopefully the other part that you guys will take from this um, is, is like, we're, we're here for a reason. We're on a journey. This planet ain't the last stop, you know? And so let's take this journey together. It, we're forced to do that through the try. Like, you just born into a family, we, you know, we, hey, you don't like all your family members like me. <laughs> you know, but you love, you gotta love them. Cause they're your family member. <laughs> you know, that's just real. So it's like exploring themes like that. Um, exploring themes like that and, and trying to, um, just trying to deconstruct the world as we live in it now, in the way that we see it now and envisioning what it could look like for the better in the future. Even though there's a lot of conflict and, and action and stuff like that going on this, in, in this book, it's all leading towards the better. It's all leading towards unity. Um, when you say, I love that you said Uzochi is love and Lencho is hate and then you put it in the blender because I feel like in the process we were like, we kept talking about, you know, good versus evil and conflict and we were like, but are there, is he really all love? And is he, and then we, and then the conflicts between their fathers, um, I, and we really kind of peeled the onion back and, and talked about personalities and how sometimes 
bad people could do good things, good people could do bad, bad things. Thing. Exactly, because they're human, mm -hmm. you know? You know, anyone has the ability to do anything, you know, whether it's over here or over there, you know? And I thought that was important when we had those discussions about, I mean, yes, Uzochi's love, but he's human. So he's still trying to figure out life. And, Lynn and shows, he's a teenager. He's so. a teenager. And, and Lynn shows, I, I know the word hate sounds harsh, but that's just sort of the archetype that he represents. But he's still human, you know? So it doesn't mean that he's a, he doesn't have the ability to love. And I thought the idea of, it's an ancient idea, you know, yin yang. Mm -hmm. But I thought the idea of bringing that together and saying, hey, they're cousins. That means they're related. What does that mean? You know, it, this is what I was thinking to myself about, like, as I was writing, what does that mean about these feelings? You know, what does that mean about if, if love was a cousin to hate and vice versa? I was trying to unpack that for myself, to be honest. You know, everybody in this room has had a bad thought at some time of their life. You know, nobody's perfect, you know, but at the same time, everybody in this room has done good you know, good for others and things of that nature. So it was just really, I just went into my strange imagination and <laughs> created these characters to sort of represent these, these, these messages, you know? Um, digging into the characters more and the magic aspect of this book, um, so the character, I mean, you could say it's, kind of, it's a metaphor for what, growing up, but they discover that they are actually uh, the carriers of a magical legacy, and that um, when their parents left Nubia, they kept a secret from their children because they thought it no longer applied um, now in their new lives in this new, in this new place. Uh, so this is where the, the magic mythology comes in, and I would love to talk about your influences there, <laughs> and yeah. you know, kind of also how if you realize you're getting a magical power, it's probably going to be terrifying. Yeah, so it's like a blend, right? Like, so the mythology is that, as I said earlier, um, in the world of Nubia, the before the book starts, it was a utopian society, perfect world, imbalanced with the land, and people had powers, you know? They had kinetic powers. Everyone had a different thing, right? And so when that land was, was um, destroyed, you know, this next generation who's in this book, they don't know anything about powers, and their parents haven't told them anything about that. Um, and what, <laughs> what happens in the book is like, so this is, I'm not going to the other side of what I'm saying, is that puberty is happening. <laughs> so as puberty is happening, you know, each kid is like, the, the powers are coming out in different ways and they don't know what it is. So that's something that I unpack in the book as well. But to me, in terms of like life itself, um, we have so much available to us um, and we stay stuck on so many levels. And if we just, not just use our minds, but use our hearts, I believe we all have magic in us. I truly believe that. Now, is that magic that I could just look at this microphone and it move? I don't know, <laughs> you know? But it could be the magic of me just saying, hey, have a nice day, to someone that changes their life. Or having a conversation with a kid who might be on the verge of suicide, and I don't even know. I'm just like, hey, man, I love you. And that I love you changes the entire trajectory of life. That's magic to me. You know, so I try to, obviously, it's more, what's the word, fantastical? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in, the, in the book, but those are the themes. That's the essence of where it's coming from. Um, speaking of, you know, magic, I feel like there's a, we were talking about how, you know, Omar's an actor and I'm an editor and, but our common ground is storytelling, and yeah. that's, I think, also the common ground of why everyone's here is because um, comics, movies, uh, television, uh, characters, books, uh, <laughs> books made into movies, action heroes, it's all the 
um, I think the passion everyone has in there is that inspiration at the center of like taking you to another place and creating heroes, creating villains and showing us ourselves with, you know, magic and you, um, I don't know, for me, I, I'm an editor because I love stories and I'm always all, tell me a story. I don't care what, what formats it's in, what format it's in. And I think like, so that's our common love. Um, and you're actually portraying a story on the stage, mm -hmm. um, which I think is magic in <laughs> itself. Um, and, what I won't, I'm getting at here is the idea of representation yeah. um, and how classically a lot of these superheroes, a lot of these stories are starring, you know, typically white characters and so many readers, so many viewers aren't seeing themselves in there. Um, tell me about like what drove you, because I know like that is a hugely important part of this book. Um, and also about, you know, save, unity, saving children, seeing themselves in the story that normally they wouldn't. Yeah, the, listen, never blame the artist, ever. I don't care if it's a writer, director, actor, they were never the problem. The system is the problem, you know? That's mm -hmm. just the plain truth. So representation is so important because, you know, you, you want to see a reflection of yourself whether you identify as male, female, you know, trans, whatever it is, you know, black, white, yellow, brown, like whatever, mm -hmm. you know, you want to see a re representation of yourself. But I think that what's more important than that is the human experience. And when you see a representation of that, you know, that's when you grab a reader or a viewer emotionally mm -hmm. because they've been around their grandmother before, their grandfather or their mother or their father or uncle, aunt, whoever, you know, cooking this dish. I don't like that potato salad, this, that. You know, everyone <laughs> can relate to these sort of very simple experiences. But where we are now in this country, in the world in general where we are now, but in this country, representation is like become a buzzword. And I think it's like, it's necessary to have those conversations, but we, need, we don't need to have the conversations, we need the actions, mm -hmm. you know? If we wanna show true representation, you know what I mean? So again, that's why I wanted the main characters in this book to be teenagers so that it can influence the teenagers that read it now as they go through their life. You know, my, I got three kids, 23, 18, 14. Their friend groups, they don't see, they see color, they're aware of it, mm -hmm. but they don't carry that weight like that. They got friends from all over the place. Every uh, socioeconomic class, every, like, they don't care about that. They just care about, is that person a good person? Mm -hmm. You know, and again, nobody's perfect. So we're not saying that, you know, cause life is not perfect, right? Like stubbing your toe at the end of the bed is one of the, <laughs> Just you know, did it. Just did it. everybody, it can happen to anybody. But going back to the book, just the idea that these kids are finding their way and there is representation for everyone. And obviously I'm a, I'm a black man so yeah, I wanna see black representation, you know? Um, and that's important to me, you know? I hope that um, the work that I continue to do, and I hope that the work that I have done has influenced, you know, young black males through the years to be their better self, you know? To say, hey man, this, this dude came from the hood, he came from a single parent background like me. But damn, look what he did. But well, maybe I could find my path of that, you know? Whatever it is. We ain't saying you gotta be a billionaire, but just build a decent life for yourself and be good to people. So that's why I stand on like the representation because, you know, I represent all of you. I represent human beings. I've had a very interesting life. As you mentioned earlier, I grew up in New York City and 
you're gonna meet every different type of person in New York City. They got every pocket of, whether it's Chinatown, little Russia, little Italy, like all the Jamaicans, like everything. And Jewish people, I grew up next to a synagogue, you know? How could I not respect Jewish people? When I used to hang out with their kids, when we was playing ball in the yard, and I was interested in learning about Shabbat and this, well, what does this mean, what does that mean, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what it all comes down to, us respecting each other's um, cultures because the world is too vast for us to all be the same. We're supposed to be different, but we don't accept our differences. So we try to unpack that in the book too. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take it more to personal stuff. How did being- Y'all good? <laughs> all right, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think your skills as an actor helped you in writing this book and creating this world and these characters? It helped me immensely because, as you said earlier, it's, it's about storytelling. And um, I've actually been writing. For, I wish someone would have told me to be a writer first because I probably would have did that. Really? Um, probably made a lot more money. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I've been writing for years. I've been, you know, selling screenplays and TV shows and stuff like that. And the art of storytelling from the technical standpoint is totally different from, you know, emoting it, right? So bringing all of that uh, experience into this book absolutely helped me because I understood the assignment at hand, you know? And so even when we had our first conversations and you, Man, you used to ask me some questions that had me up at night. Like, <laughs> I'm like, uh, to like one simple thing, and I'll just be up all night, you know, think because, but, 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 and I appreciate that because you were like, this is a world that you're building, and everything has to align. Mm -hmm. it, there's a math to it all. And, um, but for me, to your question, like, just me being an actor, you know, it gives, it gives me a freedom, you know, um, to tell stories. Like I know how to do that, like the back of my hand. That don't mean it's always gonna be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it, it's a freedom to explore. Cause I, I know a lot of writers and I think a lot of times people get caught up in their heads. Um, they don't let it go, you know? And then you gotta follow through. And me, like, I'm like a, once I get, locked in I, I'm like a machine like my family's like get them out of here like because I won't stop you know as we did with this like mm -hmm. we had to get it done and um so yeah being an actor has helped me immensely do you come up with backstories for your characters that's, that's absolutely I'm okay absolutely but as an actor um you have to you have to build out a whole person uh a whole human being a whole life you got to know What's their favorite color? What's their favorite food? Why don't they like this show? Why do they like that show? Everything, as much as you can, mm -hmm. you know, because it informs each moment um, when that camera's on, you know? And then and the fun part for me is like, the other people you're working with are doing the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like this dance that's going around and then once you get to like, improvisation or what have you or because you know a lot of people don't realize that like whether you're doing television or film it's a really collaborative process right the writer writes the thing the director comes on and has ideas about the thing the producers have ideas about the thing and then the cast comes in and everybody has an idea about that individual character mm -hmm. and it's again you put it in the washing machine you're like we good? <laughs> <laughs> Which you is know? like true of bookmaking too, as you know, like we worked with the co-writer Clarence so really hard yeah. and, and then- Shout the, out to Clarence A. Haynes, my co-writer on this, by the way. Who's in Germany right now and couldn't yeah. join us. Shout out to Clarence, man. Um, he was amazing. He's like also amazing. so well read in the superhero genre of, in the comic book world that it was, you know, his, his backstories for all the characters and their special powers. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that's good enough. We don't need more. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have done this without Clarence because he's, because, you know, it's a, it's a, 
it's a genre. Like, you know, me as a creative, I just go. Um, and so I didn't know, I had to learn so much along the way. Like, this is young adult sci-fi, you know, you know, these are the uh, comp books, I guess you could say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and this, that, and the other, you know, this language is a little too harsh, or maybe this language is a little too soft, like all of mm -hmm. these things I'm learning as we're going along in the process, and Clarence was amazing, because he was just spot on everything, like, you know, maybe we should do, but he would always, our conversations, um, I'm trying to find a right, he, he always kind of takes my lead, if that's the right way mm -hmm, to say it. Yeah. Because I know the, the, the story, but it's like floating around. And he, he molds. Helps me mold it like, okay, here's how we can say this better. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe this, we need more description here for this particular thing. Yeah. You know, but like I said, I'm a machine. I'm just going and just, I'm just like, you know. And <laughs> He's a great co-pilot. And I feel like you guys were so good about giving each character these in-depth backstories of like, well, that are very important to the story and to the sequel, which is underway right now, of like parent motivations and yeah. uh, uh, get, as we as I said earlier, peeling back the layers of the onion to see what's under the surface of these yeah. relationships. Yeah. I'm, um, so to give a little backstory, um, this took us, what, three and a half years to write the first book? Three years? Was it three years? I mean, we started during the pandemic, so we I think it was two years. We started during the pandemic, yeah. two years, okay. Yeah. But I had this concept for 10 years, um, and, and um, as Krista mentioned earlier, I did write a memoir um, from fathers to fatherhood about um, growing up without a father, becoming a father, right? And um, I went to this big book convention and now, this whole time, I have this, I have Nubia in my head, but I just didn't activate on it yet. And I went to this book convention, and I saw all of these kids run into this one booth. And I was like, who's over there? And they were telling me, and I was like, kids still read books? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that was the light bulb moment. Like, hey, man, you need to get this out of your head now. And, and that's when I started working on it. Um, um, to write it. So, you know, I just um, push everybody in whatever it is that you do. Never give up on yourself. Always, always push for your greater and always push for your dreams because they are attainable, you know, and it doesn't matter. You got to understand, I grew up the son of a teacher. My mother was a vice principal, principal, deputy superintendent. I'm saying that to say, if you teach kids, you're a hero to me, a hero. Because the, the dollar amount don't define your greatness. Mm -hmm. What you do defines your greatness, you know? So it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. As long as you're trying to help another person along the way, that's all we're here to do, because we need each other. You know, if I fall down off the, off the stage, I would hope somebody would come over and say, hey, give me a hand to get up, you know? Because we got to ride this thing out together. Who, okay, so who would your dream cast be for a Nubia the Awakening movie or television? Really? Oh, you stumped me again, Chris. <laughs> you know what? To be honest with you, I would want to find what they call new blood. You know? I would want to find, like, the, the next Chadwick Boseman, you know? Um, th that's what I would want to do. I would want to find some young talent that nobody knows yet, and they go, you know, tear it up, and, you know? That would be so fun to, to experience. And then finally, before we go to audience questions, um, so I know your fans are eager to hear about you and your work that's upcoming. What, is there anything you can share? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, like I said, Raising Canaan, uh, about to start filming season three. Um, just did a movie with Lee Daniels and Glenn Close. Woohoo! Um, we're working on the second book. Mm hmm. 
I got a few tricks up the sleeve. <laughs> Other than that. Um, well, we can open up to questions now. I'd, and there's a couple announcements I can give. Um, first, we have about 15 more wristbands for signed books. So um, I have uh, Omar's publicist up front, and whoever cheers can have one of these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looks okay it looks like they're all gone but you could you can pre-order the book um from any bookseller and as you can see, it has a beautiful cover. We're so excited about that. Um, OK, we also uh, will, that, the autographing will be at table three in the autographing care, uh, area, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, last one was given. Um, OK, open for questions. Hey. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm super excited about your novel. And you are an incredible actor. You definitely have influenced me over the years. Thank you. And we, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, you talked a little bit about how acting informed your writing and how it gave you this freedom and this capacity for writing that I, you know, I don't know. Being a multidisciplinary artist, I know that that probably blessed you so much. Do you feel like the opposite happened as well? That after you started to write this novel, you started to develop all this backstory and all of these intricate details, that it now actually informed your acting more and made you a better actor? For sure. As I've been on this journey as a writer, um, it's definitely, I, I tell all my young cats um, uh, that are young actors, write. You know, even if you're not, you don't have to be good at it, just try to learn how to do it because you really learn what we call story science. You see, most actors, when they read a script, they're just looking at that one character that they're reading for. They're not looking at the totality of the story. So they, they don't understand that if you change this line on page 15, it's gonna affect something on page 45. That's story science. And so it actually does help you um, become a better actor because you look, it's like you're in the matrix. <laughs> you, you <know? laughs> yeah. Thank I've, you. Had, I've had writers also say that they read screenplays to get story beats. Yeah. Um, mystery writers, a lot of times, and thriller writers will read screenplays and like. Yeah, because the, the thing about screenplays is it's a, I hate to use the word formula, but it is a formula, right? Like, this has to happen by page five. This has to happen by page 10. This has to happen by page five. And then you have screenwriters like a George Lucas who can just really move it around, and, but the same beats mm -hmm. are happening. They just don't look like they're happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's just, you know, there's different levels. I mean, you look at Quentin Tarantino is a master writer. Like, he is incredible, whether you like his films or not. But when you read his screenplays, it's like a, a, a I mean, it's incredible, you know, so. Next question. Hi, um, so I heard you talking about, you're gonna talk about you know, immigrant diasporas, you're going to be talking about classism, racism, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I hear you talk a lot about, you wanna you want talk about the human experience. I wanna know in your book, do you also talk about how the intersectionality of someone's identity affects the human experience? Because, you know, someone who is a, that black woman who you know grew up in a lower socioeconomic class who's queer is going to have a completely different human experience than someone who is white, conventionally attractive, male, you know, born in the money. Those are very different human experiences. So I want to know if you do take that on because I think that's a part of understanding the human experience. First of all, thank you for that question. That was a bold question, but I think it's necessary, mm -hmm. and I appreciate it. And we do unpack a bit of that in the book. Again, because these kids are teenagers, you kind of had to 
deal with certain issues in a certain way, but we do lean into everything you just spoke about because everyone has a different experience. And when they use that word identify, um, it's actually a really powerful word, right? And, but choice is more powerful, right? Because we choose to be how we are, right? Ult ultimately. But going back to your question, like everyone comes from different backgrounds and so forth and so forth, and, and, and you know, whether I, they identify as this, they identify as that. The way that we sort of lean into that in the book is that people are forced, they're, they're being forced to be that, right? To be identified as that versus how they feel. And so that goes back to your question, because this, this is the world we live in now. Right, people are being forced to, you know, you're classified as this because this is the way we see you, you know, and we try to unpack that in the book as well. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know Clarence, being a gay black man, that was very important to him. He said that they're really, you know, and I know from my own reading, they're in the, in the sci-fi fantasy space and the comic book space and superhero space. There isn't much representation of queer black characters and that was like hugely important to him yeah and i thought that i thought to me i'm all about fairness you know i want everybody to have a seat at the table mm -hmm. you know and have a voice in that seat that's important to me because that's how we learn that's how we grow we evolve and hey sometimes we can agree to disagree or you might teach me something new that day and I'm like oh I never thought about that you know yeah and so why not create those type of opportunities in a book like this yeah next question Hi there. I just, I just wanted to say you have such a beautiful spirit thank you're you like your whole energy is just so beautiful thank you um thank you <laughs> I just I had a more thought, like a, an inquiring question as someone who loves like series kind of books um, and I think I heard you say that you're working on the second. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, so my question is, what can we ex can we expect like a large, expansive series? And is that going to be like the individual backstories of characters? Um, just whatever you can share. I'm just curious. Krista, <laughs> <laughs> when they cut the check, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're actually. Um, we're actually working on uh, the outline for the second book now. Um, I, I built out an extensive mythology, like, but, you know, like so before the first book. Mm -hmm. And so we're just, we're, we're figuring out what to unpack in, this, in the second book. You gotta buy the first book to see the second book. <laughs> but it's, it's you know, to your question, there's going to be a lot of things that we explore, and and um, I think there'll be more of some of the parental stuff in the second book. Backstories on Backstories that, Backstories yeah. and stuff like that, so, yeah. yeah. There's some good Thank surprises. You. Thank you. Thank you for coming, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. It's just sort of Thank you. I'm just curious, as the son of an educator, I'm sure you're exposed to all things of great literature. What kind of stories appeal to you at the age of the, uh, you know, like the market for this this book as a, like a young as a young man? Um, you know, I was growing up. This is gonna sound weird, but one of my favorite books was Super Fudge. Oh, like, it's I'm, not weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, uh, you know, I like to laugh and and keep things light and then. Obviously, you, you know, you read some heavier stuff, but um, it's weird, man, because now that things, everything is digital, it's like, there's just so much. Um, but as of, like, right now, I'm really into, like, um, autobiography, like reading about people's lives, like reading about uh, Maurice White from Earth, Wind, and Fire, or if you're reading about Quincy Jones, and, you know, people like that. I, I, that really takes my time. Like I, I'm attracted to people's actual stories, so because they inform the fiction too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just gonna ask a 
How you doing? Uh oh. First of all, thank you for commenting on the humility um, so that you gained from your co co-writer. Um, we all need that humility, and I think it's great that you're so humble about that because you can learn everything from anyone. So thank you. Thank you. And also, um, a shout out to the educators because I'm also in early childhood education. Um, Woo! <laughs> appropriate language and catering this to young people. Um, I think it's amazing. And um, it's just hard being an educator right now, so thank yeah. you for giving us more material, yeah. <laughs> more things to glean from. And I'm just also very excited for your club because I'm first generation African. Thank um, you. So <laughs> from where? So I can't wait to see like all the things that you have. For, that first generation from? My parents are from Ghana. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, there we go. So Salute to Ghana. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I have to say, there's a lot of amazing food in this book. Um, a yeah. lot of like authentic home cooking. Different stuff. Yeah, different, <laughs> like from different parts of the world and America. Next question. How are you doing? First, I'm looking forward. I did want to congratulate you first on having your book completed. Thank you. And I'm excited to hear that now you're in the process of working on your second book. Yeah. In the time between now that the book has been completed and you're working on your second book, when do you think you might start again? Because you put it out there that they're looking about dream casting for turning the first book into like a TV series or something. When do you think you might start working on that? You know Good that. Good question. I mean, <laughs> well, uh, no, I want to know too. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's uh, um, I can't predict the future. But um, there have already been some initial conversations um, from some studios and stuff like that. And um, we'll see. I don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, because, it, you know, that's the other thing is uh, aside from the art piece, timing is everything. You know, so you just got to try to pick the right time and then just roll the dice. <laughs> you know, but I can't I, I can't give you like a solid answer that, to that question, um, but there have been some conversations about film or television or stuff like that. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. Hello. How you doing? Um, so Love your shirt. Thank you, you look great. Yeah. Uh, so by the way, context for the climate science is working about this a lot, and I'm always excited when artists talk about climate change and particularly the impacts and living with the world that we're making for ourselves in their art. Yeah. And especially when you're getting sort of fantastical elements in it. Can you talk a little bit more about what what your process was in balancing, you know, the, the real science of adaptation and, and adapting to this world that we have with a world where magic can happen, it sounds like, and, and how that sort of, and, and it sounds like, you have a mythology of you know how how these people live in balance with the world too. So just yeah, I, the, there's like three components to that question. So the, 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 the no, no, it's good, it's good, great question. The, the climate change part, I really um, try to do as much research as I could on The Inconvenient Truth, that's the movie I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I was talking about this, I'm sorry, but let's just come back to it. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Um, there's been a lot to clean up since then. Right, mm -hmm. exactly, and I've, I've I tried to do as much research that I can. I'm, I'm not a scientist, but then that just took me into the world of imagination. So like, you know, how I mentioned, you know, I, I have three children, and so I think about these things, you know? I think about 2050, 2060, 2070, like, like in a real way, like how we're looking at each other in this room. I don't think about it like when I was 20, I couldn't imagine it being 2022, mm -hmm. you know? It was fuzzy to me. Now it's clear in terms of what the future could possibly look like for us on this earth. And then I think about my kids are gonna have kids and their kids are gonna have kids, you know? And so it's just like, what are we really doing, you know? Um, 
And then in terms of like the, I guess you use the word magical aspects, for me, it kind of came from the ancients, you know? When I study ancient culture, I'm so fascinated at what they were able to accomplish without all of this technology. When you look at science, uh, astrology, surgery, irrigation, like you, you know, you go to these ancient worlds and it was like, wow, people had a lot of this stuff figured out and they were in balance with their environment. So that's kind of where I was coming from, like, you know, and I'm generalizing here, to be fair, but people just took what they needed, you know? They didn't over, you know, you know overkill. You, you harvested what you harvested. This family needs that, we good. You know, and I wanted to kind of bring that essence into this book, but it's in the future, because it's like you're going to be forced to have to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're going to be forced to have to go, I mean, if things keep going the way that they're going, you know, people are going to have to be forced to go back to the basics. So that's, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting stuff. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're almost done. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Of course. How you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm Bobby. Okay, so one thing you said today, you said the dollar amount doesn't help your greatness. What you do defines your greatness. And I have to say that really that really inspired me. And I am also an astronomy writer. And awesome. I'm actually a mental health advocate, and that's what I'm writing about. And okay, there you go. So one of the things that I'm really trying to tackle is really the stigma around mental health in the African-American community and what I experienced myself within my own family. And so my question for you is, what advice would you give to aspiring writers who are already in the entertainment industry and don't really have the necessary connections to kind of make this thing happen? So. Great question, and um, salute to you. Um, you know, I always have this saying, we, you have to create your own tradition. And what I mean by that is we, we stay after it, you know? Because I look at it differently. Like, the, it, it, there's so many, I guess you, the word is tools now to get into any industry, really, you know? Um, and yeah, Hollywood's a hard place, but everywhere's a hard place to get into, you know? It's hard to become a doctor. It's hard to learn how to drive a bus, like, whatever it is, you know? So the thing is, is, is sticking by your passion and trying to master that. And the doors will open, especially with what you say you're writing about. Um, I think that's important. I think that mental health, yeah, there's a stigma in the black community, but if we really look at it, and I'm saying this in a sort of lighthearted way, we all have a mental health issue, <laughs> some version of something, right? Like now they're just breaking it down so much, though, you got this, you it's like, nah, sometimes just, that dude need a hug. They ain't never been hugged before. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, the kids, they told all oh, the kids got 80, it's like, no, you're taking away all of the public parks and arts classes and stuff. They don't have any way to push that energy out. So you see what I'm saying? So I'm not, trying to debunk that in any way. I'm just saying there's a, it's, it's all perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because we're, as I said before, we're all human beings, we're all gonna go through ups, downs, this, that, and the other. It's just some people deal with them in other ways, you know, um, than others. And that's why I think it's so important to bring it kind of back to your question, but that's why it's so important that we help one another. I'm telling you right now, you never know just you saying hello to someone could literally change their life. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna share a story which, uh, that my wife knows. I'm only saying this to this point. Uh, this, this happened two days ago. Homeless dude. I, I'm telling this story that don't, this is not about me. 
what happened to me never happened before. I, get, I gave him some money, and he asked me, why did you help me? As many homeless people that I've experienced in my life giving them some money or whatever I had on me, I've never heard that before. And he said, why did you help me? And I said, because I should. And I hope that you would do the same for me. And he was just staring at me and I was just staring at him. So it brings me back to, you know, what, what you were asking about, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is real life. So keep, keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing, sis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.